I was born in San Antonio. I was raised on the west side of San Antonio in the barrio. And I look back on it now and realize that we had an incredible wealth of experience. Um, it was always hard for me growing up to identify with the images that we had externally of what a barrio was supposed to be because I didn't feel deprived, I didn't feel it was a slum, I didn't feel it was a ghetto. I felt it was a, a, a fiesta full of all kinds of primos and abuelos and tios and tias. Uh, it was um, a, a life full of cuentos. Um, we had a tremendous history. That's not to say that all of the experiences were perfect or that our treatment was Cinderella type. Uh, our treatment was often mixed with experiences that were negative. And yet this blended into a total picture of life, uh, a life that was balanced between the positive and the negative, between the um, prejudices and, and, the, um, and the positives, both together. Um, I think about some of the things that happen that I now can laugh about, that I can create characters about, at the time were very confusing. I'll never forget uh, Maria Guadalupe Soriano, who sat in front of me. And our, our eighth grade science teacher would say, don't speak Spanish, it's a dirty language. And Maria Guadalupe would sit at her desk and she would mumble and she would grumble and she would say, my mother does not speak a dirty language and my grandmother does not speak a dirty language. And she would just mumble and grumble it because she couldn't say it too loud in front of a teacher. Um, so we had these experiences that were negative and I'm surprised today that so many of us survived those experiences and turned it very creatively to the positive. And I look now at the people that I went to junior high with, and they've become artists, filmmakers, writers, uh, statesmen, people that contribute to their society uh, and make a uh, positive application of their cultural individuality. Um, I, I'm surprised, in part, because I also know that there was the negative influence, uh, that there was the frisking going in and out of junior high. We were considered a very tough junior high. Um, we were uh, considered the, uh, the rough side of town. I didn't know this, and I think a lot of my friends didn't know this. When you grow up in something, you think that's the way everybody is. You don't realize that other junior highs are not frisked. And we were frisked going in and out of the cafeteria. The boys would get in one line and the girls would get in another. And uh, the girls had their purses checked and they would check us to make certain we didn't have perfume bottles or deodorant bottles or mirrors or teased hair. And these were the days of bouffant hairstyles, big puffy teased hairstyles in the early 60s and mid 60s. And, and we would ask the teacher, but ma'am, how come we can't have teased hair? And she'd say, oh, because if you get into a fight, you're going to reach into your hair, you're going to pull out the knife, and you're going to stab somebody with it. And we said, oh. Ma'am, how come we can't have perfume bottles and deodorant bottles and mirrors in our purses, ma'am? And she'd say, oh, because if you get into a fight, you're going to take that mirror, you're going to break it, and you're going to slash somebody with it. And we said, oh. And we learned a lot in junior high, but it wasn't what they expected us to learn. It was about the stereotypes, and it was about their expectations of us. And young children are always influenced by the expectations so certainly some of us did go on and uh, do what we were trained to do. The boys were frisked and frisked, and they went on to learn to be frisked. Um, and yet even through all that, we survived because there was a lot of goodness in the values. There was a lot of emphasis on siendo decente, uh, portándose como la gente, uh, being uh, respetuoso, there were very, very positive values within our culture that survived even all the negative stereotypes that we encountered in the schools. I encourage parents, I encourage grandparents, I encourage big brothers, big sisters, and, and if you're the student, you yourself, to look within the beauty of your culture, look within what you have, because we really have a lot, a lot to offer. My early experiences were not that different from anyone else's. Um, 
in the west side of San Antonio, and yet each one of us has a unique experience. Each one of us has something that happened that didn't happen to the person next door. I think about those things. What was it that, that helped me value my culture? Was it my grandmother and the fact that she loved to tell stories? Was it the fact that my mother um, would always take a pen and, and, and a paper, a pencil, whatever she would get, and try and write down uh, her, her stories, and maybe even in letters that she would write her sisters that lived far away, she'd try and write them and capture her own experiences. Um, was it the fact that my father always told me stories about his mother, a grandmother that died when I was one year old, and he would say, mi mamá siempre decía, uh, no hay sábado sin sol ni domingo sin misa. Dime con quién andas y te diré quién eres. He always had dichos that he said, mi mamá siempre decía, my mother always said. And so I grew up saying, my grandmother always said, no hay sábado sin sol. And this was a grandmother that died when I was one year old, but I felt I knew her because of the stories that my father told about her. I knew her through him. And I hope that my children will say, my grandmother always said, my great-grandmother always said, my great-great-grandmother always said about people that maybe lived 100, 150 years before them. Those are the valuable things about our culture, the stories that we tell, the values that we carry on interpersonally, and that I hope to transmit in my characters. I try and capture reality in my characters. I don't want to make personajes, um, uh, fictional characters, that are perfect, that only say smart things, that only uh, do the, the, the right thing all the time, that are, that are heroes and heroines who never make a mistake, that are without blame. I don't think that's real. I don't think that's human. Tia Sofia was different. She wasn't like my other aunts. She, how can I explain it to you? She, she had a record shop on the west side of San Antonio, on the west side of downtown. She called it L.A. Record Shop. Not L.A. like Los Angeles. L.A. like L.A., El B, El C, y El Alphabet. She was, she was different. She, uh, she was up with all the latest. She liked to sing to the latest hits. She liked Motown. And, and worse than that, she spoke Tex-Mex, you know? English mixed with Spanish, only she mixed it again with black English and all the latest slang. She wasn't like my other aunts. My other aunts were more like Tia Esther, always at home, haciendo caldo, making caldo, making guiso, making tortillas, making enchiladas, making empanadas, making entomatadas. She never left the house except to go to church, braided her hair, on top of her head, and always said, todos los gringos se parecen. <laughs> it's what she said, all Anglos look alike. And then there was Tia Anita, smart, proper, teaching, decent. And then there was Tia Febe, and Tia Sara, and Tia Eloisa, all my aunts, all in church, always in church, while Sofia said, well, I listen to Tennessee Ernie Ford on, and Mahalia Jackson on Sunday mornings. See? And she did and sang along, never learning that only singing in church counted. She never made it through school either. Instead of ethnic jokes, my family told Sophia jokes, you know? Hey, remember that time at the lake on Sophia? Oh, yeah. Hey, Sophie, get out of the water. It's raining. No, she would answer. Me mojo. <laughs> which means I'll get wet. We never really did know how to deal with Tia Sofia. After she died, the family didn't know what to say, didn't feel quite right saying she's always been a good Christian. So they praised the way, um, siempre se arreglaba la cara, you know, she fixed her face up, she put on colorete blush, you know, mascara y todo, and, and she dyed her hair. Sometimes black, sometimes red, pero se cuidaba la cara. She took good care of her face. And that's all they could think of to say. Until after a while, somebody said, well, you know, 
She never fooled around, even though she could have. After Uncle Raymond died, when she was still young, only 71. <laughs> the next voice I'd like to share with you belongs to a very young girl. Her name is Teresa. She was named for her Tia Teresa and her Grandma Teresa and her Grandma's Grandma Teresa. And they call her, for short, Tere. That is very proud of her name. And she's also very proud of the new level in her life because she is about to head to her very first day of school. And for Tere, as for many children from the diverse cultures of this nation, the very first day of school is their very first contact with the large dominant culture that surrounds us. So I'll share with you the voice of Tere, not because it's a solitary voice or a unique voice, but because it happens so, so often. That it happened 40 years ago and 20 years ago and this morning. And I share with you, Tere. Hi. Yeah, I went. I went to first grade and it was fun. Yeah, and there were lots of things. Yeah, like, like there were books, big books like that. Uh, and there were, there, there were desks. Yeah, and, and, and there was a chalkboard and chalk too. Yeah, fíjate nomás. And, and, and there were a lot of kids. And there was a teacher. She was pretty, la teacher. She come up to me and she say, hi, my name is Miss Jones. And I say, hi, my name is Tere. And she say, oh, Terry. And I said, no, Tere. She said, no, Terry. No, Tere. Watch my mouth. Terry, Terry, see? No, it's Tere. It's pronounced Terry. No, it's pronounced Tere. Terry, Tere, Terry, Tere, Terry. Okay, it's Terry. Pero, no importa. No importa, it doesn't matter. Because then, then uh, uh, the teacher, she say, she gonna teach us stuff, and, and, and I say, teacher, teacher, I know how to write my name. She said, that's nice, now sit down. Teacher, teacher, I know how to write my name. Teacher, I know how to write my name. She said, that's nice, now sit down. Teacher, I can write my name. Teacher, I can write my name. And, and, and then the teacher, she teaches stuff like how to sit down, <laughs> how to raise your hand and lower your hand, how how the boys go one line and the girls go another, you know? Pero no importa, no importa, because then, then we got to watch a movie. Yeah, because the teacher, she said she had too many peppers to fill out and she had to fill out the peppers. So while she fill out the peppers, we got to watch a movie. It's la movie de la Cinderella. And she was so pretty, la Cinderella, hijo. It was a good movie. And then when we finished, the teacher still filling out the peppers, and so she, she gives pictures to color, and they give you the colors. Then they take them away, but first they give them to you. And so, and so I got to color my picture, La Cinderella. She was pretty, La Cinderella. She was, she, she looked, she like my big sister. She have long black hair down to there. She have little blue stuff on top of the eye like that. No más que my sister se pone glitter también, pero, pero no tenían un color de glitter. So no más le puse el blue stuff, but she looked just like my big sister. She was so pretty, La Cinderella. And the teacher, she come up to me and she said, oh no, Cinderella has blonde hair. And I said, no, mine has black. And she said, oh no, Cinderella has blonde hair. And she take away my picture and she give me another. And she said, okay, now do it over, do it right. And she take away that pretty picture, the one that had the long black hair down to there and the little blue stuff on the eye. Y, y no importa. No importa, it doesn't matter. 
because then, then you could smell the food coming from the cafeteria. Yeah, and I was hungry before lunch. Y te vas a la cafeteria, you know, and ahí está toda la comida. Y te agarras un tray, un tray, eh? And you're going to go get the food? And this lady dressed all in white like in a doctor's office. She come up, she say three things. You put three things in your tray. Me asustó la vieja. She scared me. Yeah, because... So uh, I, I just grabbed prunes and peas and casamole me saqué de allí because, because she scared me, la vieja. <laughs> and, I, and I don't like prunes. And, and I don't like peas. And I don't like casamole, but she scared me, la vieja. So me saqué de allí pronto because she scared me. And I was hungry after lunch. Pero no importa. Some of our kids are very assertive and spunky and have a good sense of who they are. And those are often the kids we call the troublemakers. So I'd like to share with you a voice of one of those troublemakers. She's called by a lot of people a tough kid. Other people call her a pachuca or a chola. She just calls herself la dot. And la dot uses a little bit of heavy language but it's okay because everything she says that's heavy language is in Spanish, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> the voice of La Dot in junior high. I like these earrings. They're not long enough. Yo quería uno de esos grandotes, you know, like this, you know, the great big ones like that, pero todo no. Oye, tú nomás no, la Silvia no vale nada, está bien, puta. Hijo, corriendo tras el Larry. Y el Larry don't like her. I know, because he likes me. He told my brother. And then he asked me if I'd meet him a la tiendita after school. Está bien chulo ese. Es el más good looking de toda la class. <laughs> Hijo. And the other day he had on his blue shirt con el color para arriba así. And you could see his medallón on the chest, como siempre. <laughs> Los tenis Reebok. Y el white hanky. Está bien pasito. Y la Silvia, she thinks she's going to get him. Pero nomás con chains, girl, because he's after me and I'm not going to chase him away. I mean, it's not my fault he likes me, is it? No, hombre, tú no te apures. They say, she's going to jump me. Pero tú no te apures, manita. Yo me defiendo, yo me defiendo. Because nobody, nobody insults la dot. <laughs> hey, the other day, la Mary Pester was writing dirty notes a la Silvia. Y ella también para atrás, and they were saying dirty things about Teodora. Me dijo Manda, y que Manda and Rosie and Teodora were going to get together in PE para dárselo a Pester y a Silvia. You bet, muchacha, aquí estoy lista. Ajá, y a ver a quién más juntamos, porque la Silvia se junta con todas esas gordonas, feotas, que están, pero perras para pelear. <laughs> They're big, man. I'm not scared of nobody. Nobody. But we got to get some big ones on our side, too. <laughs> yeah. And last showers, pa' que no vea la Miss Hensley. Because a la Miss Hensley, she don't like for us to fight on the gym floor. I think it's because it might get scratched. <laughs> I might roll two or three characters together into one to make them a more real character. So the biggest compliment I get is when people come up to me after a performance and they say, that was me. That was me you did. And I usually can tell who they're talking about just by the tone in their voice or the look on their face. You know, they'll come up with tears in their eyes and they'll say, that was me. And I know it was Tere. I know it was when they were in first grade uh, or second grade or kindergarten or whenever they had those experiences. And the funny thing is, I don't apologize for my characters being Mexican-American, being between two cultures, being English-speaking and Spanish-speaking mixed together. I don't apologize for their uniqueness. Um, I go specifically into what is that character, be that a character that shopped, that solo served, that, 
that liked Motown, that uh, uh, spoke more English than Spanish or more Spanish than English. I try and present them exactly the way they appear at Las Calles. And because of that, it goes deep without trying to make them a universal character. I make them very specific to their culture, and they go deep, and they touch the human roots, and people on the opposite end of the world recognize them and recognize their own human roots in there too. The valley is an incredible treasure chest. It really has human beings that are so well-versed in both cultures and in both experiences that sometimes they don't see it. They don't see how filled up they are with a duality which provides sensitivities to other cultures. I think all of our diplomats in the U.S. should be bicultural. I think that people that go to China or Africa um, have a lot more sensitivity if they've been raised between two cultures. And in the valley, we have that which all border peoples have, frontera peoples, people that have grown up on the borders. They're not just bilingual and bicultural. They're also bipolitical. They understand two systems. They know how things work in two different uh, countries. And, and, and they almost make people who are not raised on a border look naive because they understand that there's more than one way to do things. And so their sensitivities are very high. Uh, and I think they have a lot of skills. What I feel about the Rio Grande Valley is that many times those skills are undeveloped. We haven't had the access, we haven't had the development, the opportunities that a lot of other places have had. And, and we have some brilliant people out here with talents that sometimes they themselves don't recognize, desprecian lo suyo. They, they don't see their own wealth. Um, or they allow themselves to be talked down or talked into um, a, a, a political uh, place. Oh, this is where you belong. Keep your place. Know your place. And we're much more competent than that. They say that writing is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. And that's true. But I also tell people, uh, listen. Listen to the voice inside of you. And be willing to write about the things that occur to you. But keep writing. Write and write and write and don't stop. You learn how to become a better writer by writing. And keep a journal. Write every night. Write about everything that happens. You may think you're going crazy writing about everything. But keep on writing and read. Read other writers. Read what's out there. And you get ideas and you become more sophisticated day after day, year after year. Uh, don't stop. And don't let anybody tell you you can never be a writer because you're not sophisticated enough, you're not world-traveled enough, you don't have the right experiences, you're not wealthy enough, you're not smart enough. Don't believe any of that. You have to have your own voice. Each one of us has a voice. We have something to give. Um, listen to what's inside of you. Learn, grow, read, hear others, but always go back and listen to what's inside of you and keep writing and growing. How to become a writer? You know, you stare at a blank piece of paper until drops of blood form on your forehead. <laughs> it's a hard life. It is lonely. It is a struggle because nobody can tell you that you really said what you wanted to say. You're the only one who knows if you really said what you were trying to say. And yet, it's so rewarding. Nothing bad can ever happen to a writer because it's all material. Something bad happens, good, you can write about it. So I enjoy it, and I would tell any young person wanting to be a writer, do it. Nothing can hold you back. You can write any time that you can find chalk or ink or lead or grass or blood. Anything that will make a mark on a piece of paper will record what your view of the world is, what your feelings are, what your unique experience has been. And that voice, that experience, should be heard. Sometimes I read things that were written 500 years ago and I say, 
they understood. <laughs> they, they, they knew what we're doing right now. Have we advanced or have we not? Um, I don't think there'll be that many changes in the new millennium, but I do sense that our world will grow smaller as it's continued to grow smaller. We have contact with people from around the world. If you can get onto email and get onto a computer, you can communicate with people from Russia and China and Africa, you know, provided they have access to a computer. It makes it a smaller world, and I see that awareness, and I see more pride. I think we're entering a more humane time period. Um, usually the change of a century does become a time period of reflection on the past, on the future, on our own humanity. I think there's been some great peacefulness that's come in in early years of any change. If we can um, keep our focus in that time period, that there's a time of rebirth, there's a time of reassessment, a time to look at what has happened and what the promise is for the future. It's like a morning, a new dawn. It's very symbolic. It's a time for waking up. So I think we take those moments of peace and we can be very creative with them and we can write and we can show not only our history but our potential for the future. Chicano literature has a lot that has come before now. But people need to remember that a culture is ever-changing, that we don't have to do what we did 50 years ago or 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago or, or five years ago, that there's no party line that has to be followed, that culture is always dynamic and changing, that our culture is being invented every day in our own lives. Our culture is what we make it. And all the promise, all the potential is there to make it what we want it to be, to, to draw from other cultures, to borrow as we always have, as every culture always have, has, and, and to make the most of our mestizaje. We have a blending, a dynamic blending of cultures. It's part of what Chicano culture is, but it's a mestizaje. If you go back into our Mexican heritage, it's a mixture of Spanish and Indian. If you go into the Indian heritage before that, it's a mixture of the, of the different indigenous cultures. If you go into the Spanish heritage, it's a mixture of Arabic and Jew. It's a mixture of, of uh, uh, Indian from India. The Gitano was, was from the East, was from the Indian cultures. And the similarities between flamenco and modern Indian dance are Amazing. They're stunning because those are the roots of where it came from. It is a culture of many minorities coming together. So we take that that we had and we put it in the context of the U.S., of the present, of the Anglo-American culture. We add in another cultural influence and we take from it. We draw from it and we add something new. And I always tell people that our, our cultura is a blending. We've got all the future ahead of us, all the possibilities, all the potential. I read Deepak Chopra, and he talks about the, the field of unlimited possibilities, and it's all very new age, and it's very modern. And you know what I see in it? I see the Mayan philosophy from thousands of years ago, the, the Kinan and the, uh, uh, the, the Pishan, the field of unlimited possibility, where the Mayan poet would say, you are the other me, in La Quech. You are the other me. I am the eagle, I am the mountain, I am the, the high priest, I am the woman in labor, I am the child being born. They weren't being poetic, they were being philosophical. They felt that their spirit was unlimited and was in contact with everyone else. And it was a beautiful spiritual mestizaje, a blending. Of, of different experiences. That's what we have ahead of us. That's what we have to look forward to. That which is cyclical comes from the past, but goes forth, opens up the whole world to us.